the topic for today's discussion is the uh, stochastic approximation theorem uh, in reinforcement learning and machine learning there is perhaps no other important theorem than stochastic approximation theorem Now this proof is, uh, the proof of stochastic approximation theorem is fairly technical. Uh, we are going to cover the proof outline uh, and the interested readers can or, or interested people can look into this book. Uh, there are multiple books, Kushner and Yin, uh, I think 2013. And then Borker, 2008. Uh, we are going to be following this particular book today. So this book, chapter two, that's what we are going to be talking about today. This book is available online for free. Well, it's not for free, but we all have access to Springer Link, so therefore you can download this book on Springer Link's website and you can uh, you can read chapter two for uh, learning in details what the precise um, proof is, okay? But the precise proof requires a lot of mathematical background, so if you don't have the background, perhaps reading this book will not help you. Okay, so what's the setting of stochastic approximation theorem? So we have a stochastic dynamical system xk plus 1 equals xk plus beta k hxk plus mk plus 1. So this is noise. This is step size. And this is of course your value function, q function. Uh, in the case of stochastic gradient descent, it would be the iterate xk and so on. Okay, so all the asynchronous algorithms that we have seen so far, they are all an instantiation of this particular algorithm. So let me show you why. So most of the algorithms that we talked about, so let's say your Q learning algorithm, so Q k plus 1 equals to 1 minus beta k q k plus some transformation, so let me write f. Have we used f so far? No, right? We haven't used f. So let me use f as a generic function, f q k comma some noise wk which basically encapsulates all the information about how you are updating or what uh, coordinates of qk you would be updating at that particular iteration okay so this is the q learning algorithm, algorithm. this is q learning so let me rewrite this expression as follows Right now, so I have added an expectation. So I need to subtract the expectation. 
Yeah. We got extra beta k. For f. Yeah. So there is there is. Oh, there is beta k that gets multiplied by f. If you go back and look at any of the other asynchronous algorithms or STARSA or algorithms of that sort, they all can be written in this particular form. Where the, of course, the meaning of the function f would change, the meaning of wk would change. Sometimes wk are the set of coordinates that you are updating. Sometimes wk is uh, just the current sample, the state and action sample that you receive from your algorithm or from your simulator. So, the meaning of WK would change, but otherwise the essential structure of the algorithm is exactly this. This is defined as MK plus 1. This is defined as H of UK. And therefore, the overall update equation can be written as which is exactly in this format. Any questions? So, you have implemented this algorithm in the context of gradient descent in uh, assignment 1, last problem and there this was the gradient operator, so H was computing the gradient at XK and this was just a Gaussian noise, zero mean Gaussian noise. Okay. So, that was also an instance of the stochastic approximation algorithm. Now, when, of course, we have been talking about beta k to be a tapering step size, which means beta k converges to 0 at a sufficiently slow rate. Uh, but then you can also have beta k equals to constant, which is a constant step size algorithm. Again, something that we have implemented for gradient descent in assignment 1. So, you could have constant step size, you could have tapering step size. We are not going to talk about constant step size today. We are just going to talk about tapering step size. All right. What's the question we want to answer? We want to show the result that x k converges to x star almost surely, where x star satisfies h of x star equal to zero. We will of course place assumptions on uh, on many things in order to prove that result. Okay, but that's the result we want to get. How do we use this in the reinforcement learning or in optimization? So XK is your iterates from stochastic gradient descent, it converges to the optimal solution where the derivative at the optimal solution is equal to zero. Okay, so that's something you know from optimization class 5759. Uh, in the case of Q learning, QK converges to Q star, where Q star is the optimal value function. Okay, so Q star would satisfy T of QK minus QK equals to 0. Okay, so remember Q is a fixed point of the operator T in the case of Q learning. In the case of value iteration, again, you have the same story in the case of uh, uh, TD lambda, again you have the same story. Okay. Yeah. Don't we need to then make some convexity assumption about H for us to say 
that it's a minimum for what we're selling? Well, yeah, so locally everything is going to be convex. Okay. So you, you're just looking at, even if you have a non-convex problem, but you are in this region, in this region it is convex. Okay. Alright, so ready for a roller coaster ride, I guess. So I'm going to be using this whole board for equations. So you will just see the board full of equations. But before uh, I get into the nitty gritties, I want to give you a high level picture of what the proof looks like. <coughs> Okay. Now in assignment 1, what did you do? So, you ran this algorithm for the gradient descent example, you ran this algorithm for constant step size and tapering step size. And then you constructed a differential equation and what most of you would have seen, if you have done your assignment on your own, you would have seen that the differential equation c of t, so c dot t equals to h of c of t, this differential equation this is your c of t and this is my t. So what you have seen in your simulation is that the solution or the iterates essentially track this differential equation. So your this was your x1, this is your x2, this is your x3, this is your x4, x5 and so on. Right? So all of you have seen this. So you, these iterates were along this solution to this differential equation. And this is exactly the result we want to prove today. So how do we go about proving it? So let me first place all the hypotheses on H and M and beta K in order to get to this particular theorem. Let me write the hypothesis here. Assumption 1, H is this chip. So H of X1 minus H of X2 norm L x1 minus x2. You can pick any norm on Rn. Beta k is tapering. The ratio of beta k is infinity. The summation of beta k square is strictly less than infinity. In k plus 1 is martingale difference voice. So martingale difference noise. Well, it satisfies the following condition. Yes. 
are the conditions same as uh, same in both the ex uh, expectation or so this is norm of n k plus one square. This is n k plus the one. conditions x not. Oh so yeah, the conditional. Okay. Yeah, this is the same. Any intuition about what martingale difference noise actually means, or is it right. just some analytic vision? Uh, so the IID noise that you used is a martingale difference noise. Okay, so uh, when you are using IID noise, this part was independent of everything that happened in the past, and this is expectation was equal to zero, and the variance of the IID noise was just a constant k. In the case of Q-learning algorithm that we talked about, there will be Q of infinity here, like the norm of Q infinity, QK infinity here in this particular case. So it is satisfied in all the algorithms, uh, but it does have a probabilistic meaning, which is that the variance. Uh, so what's the probabilistic meaning? If you look at the sum of martingales, it is going to convert almost surely. Okay, so that invokes what is known as martingale convergence theorem. And uh, no. I'm going to invoke it at some point of time. Okay. So let's go over all these assumptions one by one. H is lifted. This allows us to not only get the bound, to, but to make sure that this differential equation has a solution. Okay. So when that's a sufficient condition. If H is lifted, then the differential equation will always have a solution. Okay. And it will be bounded. It won't escape to infinity. So that happens because H is lifted. Beta k is tapering. You have seen this in optimization without justification. Today you are going to see why we need this tapering condition uh, for beta k. Okay. It's very important. Mk plus 1 is martingale difference noise. Uh, Again, a technical condition satisfied by all the algorithms. It leads to some very, it invokes very important result that we will talk about soon. Uh, and, and, and that is going to allow us to make sure that this martingale does not go unbounded as k goes to infinity. The resulting martingale, so we will we'll construct that resulting martingale in, in a few minutes. The last assumption basically says no matter how you run your algorithm, it should not blow up. Okay. Typically, you achieve this. Uh, so, okay, so my, my question is how would you achieve this? How would you make sure that your code does not blow up during a, a gradient descent example or during some Q learning example? I am sure you have used it, but I want you to recognize that. When you run such algorithms, you somehow make sure that things don't blow up. What do you do? Sorry? Sorry? Step size? No, no, not step size. There's nothing to do with step size. Yeah. Well, you know, just in general, I have some iteration caps so I could bound the series. So right. I knew it didn't diverge. Correct. So, um, no, but this holds for all k. So I don't know whether you are looking at k. You are talking about fixing k value or fixing the x value. I was thinking of fixing k, which you can also fix. It. Yes, but you can also fix the norm of x. So if you're if you see that your iterations are going to 10 raised to 48, you will somehow reset your algorithm so that things don't blow up after that point of time. Okay, so typically what you would do is use a projection to project the solution that is too far out back to a closed and compact set. Okay. So projection is typically useful in order to ensure that your algorithm does not blow up. Okay. Uh, normally it would not. Okay. If you are using like if you are running a regular algorithm and you pick your beta k which is tapering. It might go up to 1 billion or 1 trillion, but then it will go down to whatever steady state value it should be at. Okay, it's not going to go beyond that.
Okay. Yeah. And then and all those have to be sufficient assumptions, but are any of them by themselves necessary that if we can disprove it says is that stochastic approximation will not apply? Not that I know of. Okay. Okay. Uh, the most general form of stochastic approximation theorem is given in Kushner and Yen. But there the assumptions go from A1 to A8. So, <laughs> so I could only find this book which has only A1 to A4. So that, that particular stochastic, so the uh, stochastic approximation theorem in this particular book considers also a projection operator within this, uh, within this computation, which we are not computing, which we are not considering in this case. There is no projection. The proof is of course uh, far more technical in Kushner and Yen. Okay, so, My question is, how would you go about proving that xk is tracking the solution to this differential equation? How would you go about proving it? First of all, where is this differential equation going to stabilize? What is phi infinity? What is phi infinity going to look like? When does a differential equation stabilize? Sorry? When this part is 0, right? That's when phi naught t equals to 0. That means that phi has stabilized. It's not going to undergo any change. So what is phi infinity going to be equal to? X star. X star. Right? Because at x star, s of x star is equal to 0. Okay. So you have seen two things. First, in simulation, in your assignment, you have seen that xk tracks the differential equation and now you have learned that the differential equation is going to stabilize at x star. Okay. Now my question is, forget about the assumption, how would you go about proving that statement under whatever assumption is being there? Yeah. First we need some notion in that uh, if we ignore the noise, it would converge, and then we need to have the idea that the noise isn't bringing us so far away that we it won't then converge to the right answer. Correct. Okay. Uh, With it being a generalized random variable, I'm not sure what's the correct constants to be right. in that process. Correct. Okay. Okay. So let's let's think about that particular idea. Uh, What's the discretized solution to this differential equation? So P let me define the following thing. P K to be summation beta S S equals to zero to K. So how do I get P of T K plus one? What's the discretized solution to a differential equation? Well, P of Tk plus 1 is approximately equal to P of Tk plus beta k h of P of Tk. Right? All of you agree to it? Beta k sufficiently small. All of you concur with this equation? Okay, this is how we used to solve differential equations when we were young. Oh, well, uh, all of us are young. <laughs> uh, but we were younger, maybe. We were, when we were in early 20s or late, nine, late teens, this is how we would solve a differential equation. By picking a small n of beta k and setting ttk plus 1 in this fashion. Now, the only difference you see here is that now there is a noise getting added. Okay. And that noise is creating a problem. What we are going to show is that if A2 and A3 holds, 
then the noise doesn't really affect. Okay, so that's what his point was. You somehow bound the effect of noise by picking a step size that decays to zero uh, uh, eventually. Okay, that's intuition number one. <coughs> However, this kind of approximation only makes sense when beta k is small, but in the beginning, beta k could be large. Okay, so we somehow have to look at the tail of this sequence, uh, sorry, this trajectory and the tail of this sequence. Okay, but still, this is a trajectory, this is a function of time, this is not a function of time, this is just a discrete points in the x space. So how do you construct a trajectory out of points in order to assess the difference between two trajectories? Any thoughts about that? Okay, so I give you a bunch of points. I want you to create a trajectory, what will you do out of these points? Come on. Yeah. These squares? Least squares. Uh, no. So least squares is only going to give you a hyperplane, but it's not going to give you a trajectory. Interpolate. Interpolation. So what kind of interpolation do you want to use? Linear? Okay. So let's just do a linear interpolation between the points. Okay, so now I have a trajectory in the xk space, I have a trajectory in the differential equation space and I can try to see, assess the difference between these two trajectories. Okay, and that's the proof technique that we are going to go off. Any questions so far? Okay, bunch of definitions.
we are going to make use of this whole definition. The result we are interested in proving this is lemma. This is almost sure. I hope all of you remember, let me write down somewhere, TK is summation So you were plotting XK versus TK in your assignment 1, remember? You have computed this TK value for all the simulation. What is this? Uh, so this is the interpolated uh, uh, trajectory between the iterates. So this is through a linear interpolation. Okay. This one is the solution to differential equation with initialization phi s of at value s is given by x bar of s. Okay. So this x bar of s is the same as this trajectory. This is a summation of all the noise terms that you are going to see in the uh, in the stochastic approximation case and this is the difference of the noise term from k to k plus n minus 1. Okay. Now there are multiple things in this proof. The first thing that we are going to show, uh, well we are not going to show but uh, let's try to show that this is going to become smaller under the assumption that this is IID noise. Zero mean noise. Yeah. Just to get the intuition. So what? So let m f plus one for m m be i i d zero mean finite variance. Sigma square. What is the expected value of delta k, k plus m? What would the expected value be? So m is iid 0 mean. This is iid 0 mean. What's the expected value? 0. 0. What's the Variance. Anyone wants to try what the variance is going to look like? 
n squared. You got m squared? Square, right? Right, so, so sigma square is common, so I can take it out and just uh, concentrate on things inside this bracket. What's the property of this expression as k goes to infinity? Less than zero. Why? Well, because it's tapering. Yeah. So, um, the finite subset we're looking at it will have to be zero in the tail. Yeah. So, because beta k square, sum of beta k square is finite. So, therefore, the tail of beta k square must be equal to zero. Right. So, this term goes to zero as k goes to infinity. Okay. That's because of k two. So it turns out that even if mm is not zero mean and does not have finite variance, as long as it satisfies A3, this property still holds. Okay. So A3, A2 and A3 implies that norm of delta k, k plus n square sub n greater than equal to 0 goes to 0 as k goes to infinity. So, oh I skipped a point. So, a random variable whose mean is 0 and variance is 0, what is that random variable equal to? 0. Right. Because it's 0 because the mean is 0. Right. So, random variable whose mean is 0, variance is 0, means that the random variable itself is 0. Okay. So, the random variable itself goes to 0 as k goes to infinity. So, that is the first fact that we can conclude. Uh, in order to prove this result, you need to use because so this is a very special case with IID noise. Um, but in order to prove this result, you need what is known as martingale convergence theorem. This is taught in a theory of probability class or some uh, statistics class, seven thousand level probability slash statistics class. So if you know it, great. If you don't know it. Okay. Any questions so far? Yeah. Yeah, so that guarantee the because of the properties of the random variable, is that surely or almost surely? This is almost surely. Inequality. 
So let me write fact 3, which follows from fact 2, integral pn plus k plus 1. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, what is the intuition of the significance of F three overall, or is it just necessary? So, remember, you said that the noise should not be. <laughs> So we haven't yet introduced noise, but uh, this will allow us to prove that the noise is not going to have significant effect okay. on the on the yeah. So the project the interpolated trajectory is always disturbed by noise, but the noise will not have significant disturbance to the different solution to the differential equation. Uh, so now what I'm going to do is. I am going to look at a picture for the next 10 15 minutes, okay? And we are going to go through the proof step. So, I am going to erase all this part. So, I hope all of you have noted this down.
Now I pick a point S. So let's pick a point. Um, let's pick this to be the S. So S is equal to PK. Or oh, I'm using P N. Uh, <coughs> okay, it's fine. Uh, let's pick this to be S, and I'm going to run the differential equation from this starting point. Let's say this is my differential equation. This is my P of S of P. That's the solution to the differential equation. What was the lemma talking about? So the lemma is saying that as I let S go to infinity, the difference between this trajectory and this trajectory is shrinking. Okay, it's going smaller and smaller. So, so what do we need to show? We need to show that starting from S and ending at S plus T, capital T, I want to show that the distance between this trajectory and this trajectory is shrinking. So I need to first estimate, pick, let's pick a point on the interpolated trajectory, let's pick a point on the solution to the differential equation and I want to bound this particular distance. Okay. I want to find the bound to this distance and I want to show that that bound goes to zero as S goes to infinity. Okay, that will prove the assertion. Let's say the assert, let's say I can bound it and I can show that this bound goes to zero as I let S go to infinity. What does that imply? Now remember the differential equation P dot T equals to H of P T. This will always converge to X star as t goes to infinity, which means that if the distance between this trajectory and this trajectory is becoming smaller and smaller, then it implies, now and this trajectory is going to converge to x star eventually, it implies that this particular trajectory, the interpolated trajectory will also converge to x star. Does that make sense? So if this bound is going to 0 and this trajectory is converging to x star, then it means that this interpolated trajectory will also converge to x star at some point of time. So what we are going to see is that it's going to do something like this, eventually converging to x star. So that's the argument. Okay. Now the trick or the major chunk of the proof essentially lies in establishing fact 1, fact 2, fact 3 and use that to bound this particular distance. Okay. Now we are not going to prove fact 1, fact 2, fact 3, but we will, uh, I am going to go over how do you bound this particular distance. Okay. Next, that's the topic we are going to study in the next 15-20 uh, minutes. Any questions so far? Alright, so let's zoom in in this region. Let me give these points a name. So this could be x bar 1, x bar 2, x bar 3, p 3, p 2, p 1. Okay, so I am just zooming in this particular area here and I want to bound this distance. So what is the distance? I want to bound 
norm of x2 bar minus p2 bar. P, sorry, p2. How should I delete? Uh, let's delete this side. So think about how you want to bound x bar 2 minus p2. Think about how you would bound this uh, this distance. Naturally, everyone will use triangle inequality, but how would you use it? So let me write x2 bar. So it's a linear interpolation. So it, this x2 bar lies on the line connecting x1 bar and x3 bar. So this is equal to lambda x1 bar plus 1 minus lambda x2 bar. Right? Okay. X3. Sorry? X3. Oh, yeah, x3 bar. So norm of The second thing I want to say is P2 is integral from Pk plus 3 and this is Pk plus 4. Substitute uh, the value of p1 from the value of p2 from here, and I'm going to substitute the value of p2 uh, in this particular expression. And what am I going to get? I will get the following. bar minus p1, x2 bar minus p3 plus integral pk plus 3 to pk plus 4 norm of h ds tau d tau. And of course, this lambda is between 0 and 1. So, lambda is between 0 and 1. Or maybe it doesn't matter. So, what's the salient feature of this inequality? What is this term equal to? This 
So this term I know is equal to C T okay, or less than equal to C T. So this is just C T multiplied by beta K plus 4. Okay. Now beta K plus 4 is going to 0. So therefore this term will go to 0 as you let S go to infinity. Okay. So what's the salient feature we figured from this particular inequality? I need to bound x bar 1 minus t1, x bar 3 minus t3 because I know this term is going to 0 anyways. So all I need to show is that this distance is going to 0 and this distance is going to 0. Okay, I'm going to pause here so that you can look at the figure and convince yourself that's the right thing to do. Let's go over the proof again. We want to show that this bound is going to 0 as I let s go to infinity. In order to bound this, we got an expression for the bound which is in terms of the bound at this point, the bound at this point and some term that goes to 0 as s goes to infinity. So all I need to worry about is how to bound this, so, how to bound at every tk plus m? So, I look at tk, tk plus 1, tk plus 2 and I want to find a bound at these points. Okay, and as long as these bounds are going to 0 as s goes to infinity, the result is true. So, now let us look at the bounds at these locations. Any questions on this? This is my x bar e k plus 2 and this is my p s e k plus 2. Let me write what the expressions are. That's the expression for x bar t. Now the second expression I won't get is for t starting at s. So let's start with t k. k plus m equals to.
sorry, this uh, expression is pretty bad, but it's not too difficult to understand. Could you repeat why the last term is 0? This term? Yeah. Why is this term equals to CT multiplied by beta k plus 4? Does it uh, converge to 0? Oh, why it converges to yes. 0? So, CT is a constant that depends on capital T, the choice of capital T this is finite. Now, beta k plus 4 is a tapering step size, so it goes to 0 as k goes to infinity. Right? So, converge when h of p is equal to 0. That happens at x star. Right? So, that is why it will converge to that particular point. Yeah. With a 1, is the plus delta k, a uh, k plus l included in the summation or is it isolated? Oh no, it is outside the summation. So, this is all the martingale difference sum. sum. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. let me put a bracket here. So, it is out of the summation. Alright, so, so this is the solution to the differential equation starting at x bar tk going all the way to tk plus m. But I can rewrite this differential equation in this particular form uh, so as to make my life easy. So, now there are multiple things that we see here. So, this x bar tk is the same as x. So, we need to compare this expression with this expression. Okay. I want to make sure that the difference of these two expressions goes to 0 because that is what we need. In order to bound this, we need this bound to go to 0 and that is what we are trying to compute here. So, this bound is this expression minus this expression. First term is the same. Second term is not the same because the argument here for h is x bar, the argument here for h is phi tk. But as we said, this particular difference, uh, we want to show that it is going to 0. So, this term will perhaps also be similar. So, we need to bound this term. And then this term goes to 0 as k goes to infinity and this term also goes to 0 as k goes to infinity because of this reason, okay, fact 3. So, where should I write? So, this one, so fact 1 implies delta k, k plus m goes to 0 as k goes to infinity, fact 3 implies uh, this particular summation goes to 0. Uh, how should I write it? This term goes to 0, uh, this expression, this uh, summation of integral that goes to 0 because of fact 3. So, all we need to show is that the difference between these two is 
also goes to 0 as k goes to infinity. So let's try and look at the difference of this term with respect to this term. So H of X bar EK plus N minus H of EK EK plus N not Okay, so now I'm going to invoke that H is Lipschitz. This gives me L norm of X bar PK plus N minus P of mm. Okay. Okay. We are towards the end of the movie, so don't worry about that.
Brownworth inequality is useful when you want to bound a sequence which has some inequalities associated with it. Okay? So the updates in the sequence are such that it has an inequality relationship. So this one seems to have the flavor of number 2. So, from west and equal to AKN, E raised to L, capital G. This is the theorem they are using. So, understanding the proof is kind of important. So, the proof of SARSA, proof of Q learning, proof of asynchronous descent, uh, gradient descent, asynchronous uh, algorithms, all of it follows from stochastic gradient descent. Okay, all of it follows from this particular okay. None of this proof sketch gives any insight into when the convergence behavior is. When the convergence behavior occurs. So, what we have shown here is that the solution to differential equation tells you. So, if the differential equation converges in 500 seconds, then you know your summation of beta k has to be at least 500 in order for it to get close to the solution. Okay. Do, you, do you see what I am saying? No. Let me draw a picture. Any other? Well, I will not there. Let me answer your question very quickly. You have this differential equation phi dot equals to h of phi. You start from some phi naught which is equal to x naught where you initialize your uh, algorithm and then you use stochastic approximation to convert not stochastic approximation. You ran this differential equation and it converts to x star. And let's say the differential equation hit this particular point at 500 seconds. Okay? Then it means you run the stochastic approximation, it's going to track the differential equation. 
but it's going to convert, get closer to this particular point when summation of beta k is close to 500. Okay, k equals 0 to whatever number, capital N. So you run your algorithm for at least n time steps so that your summation of beta k is close to 500 and it takes 500 seconds for the differential equation to get close to x star. That's what I was alluding to. Now, what about the finite time performance? Nobody knows. Well, it's not that nobody knows. People are now trying to bound the finite time performance so that you know that if you stop the iteration at some capital N, how far you are from the optimal solution. And it's a very complicated, it is far more complicated, that analysis is far more complicated than this analysis. Because you are interested in finite time bound, not infinite time or asymptotic bound. Thank you and uh, there is no class on Tuesday. I am going to extend the deadline for project submission to Thursday. There will be a class on Thursday and then I have to go to an airport right after the Thursday's class or probably end a little bit earlier.